Anybody hear me? You can hear me, okay. Let's see if I can see you. What a great introduction. Now, look at me. Do you believe anything she said? <laughs> but I did indeed go down the river. Uh, it was the first trip since the one that disappeared, as a matter of fact. Uh, and it was quite a river, but I'm not going to talk about that today. We'll say that uh, I was, I am, well, I was extremely impressed and enjoyed your talk last night. I'm extremely impressed with the book. There's, I guess, not many other people uh, who could look at it with such a critical eye. Uh, and I didn't think I could learn anything from the book. Uh, you know, I, didn't think, I thought I knew that everything I needed to know. Uh, when we went down, I, I'm not much of an explorer, look at me, but we did have some people who knew what they were doing. Uh, one, one of them was our doctor. Uh, he's a guy uh, uh, from Marshall Medical School in West Virginia, Huntington, West Virginia. And, but all his life, he had traveled in the Amazon region. And I mean travel. The idea of traveling the Amazon uh, it was sort of TR-ish. He would travel with Indians uh, for days, weeks at a time, uh, sometimes with nothing more than a little food, sometimes for four or five weeks, and also delivering medicine here. Up to, if occasionally uncontacted tribes, but often people who had never seen outsiders. Uh, so this man really knew about these sorts of things. And he went on our trip, and when he read Candace's book, there was uh, some things that even he hadn't thought of. Uh, uh, one of the most impressive, there's a be it's beautifully written. There's a beautiful piece, a uh, so couple of pages at the end, where she talks about the Indians uh, dogging the expedition and uh, making an internal decision about whether or not to kill him off. And uh, uh, they decided not to. And the point was that they could have at any time. And they decided to let them through. And you know, that had never occurred to John Walden, uh, who knew Indians so well. It's a wonderful book. Uh, it's very well written. As I, this is not going to be an ad all for your book, but I'm going to it's very well written, and I highly respect that. But it's not the well writtenness that I uh, uh, respect. You know, two, two, three authors here. It's the ability to write a book, and the work that goes into it. I'm often asked, you know, why don't I write a book about my trip down the down the river of doubt? Why uh, don't I write a book about this and that? I don't think I could do it. I just don't think I could do it. And anybody who can write a book, or like Doug, many books, I really respect. Well, enough of that. I'm not here today to talk about Brazil. Those of you who were here last night heard that story. That's another lecture. In fact, I gave it here once, so some of you may have heard it before. I have a different subject, and, and it relates to the overall theme of, uh, of uh, this uh, symposium. Uh, I'm going to talk about TR as a hunter, particularly as a big game hunter. And I'm going to use mostly the lesser known stories about that. Many of them are very well known, some of them uh, probably pretty well known to many people in the audience. And so all of them occasionally, I'm basically going to focus on his lesser known hunts. But I think you'll find some things of interest. And the reason I'm doing this, and it plays off what Clay said, is to try to uh, use his hunting experience uh, to understand the man and to understand how both the experience, these experiences shaped him and therefore shaped his presidency uh, and also what they demonstrate about some of his perhaps natural characteristics. He was an extraordinary man. Uh, on a personal note, when I was the age of many of you in this audience, the last thing I wanted to be known for was the great-grandson of Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, it makes you feel like a monkey in a zoo, you know. All these people come to look at you because of what your great-grandfather did. Who, as a school kid, a college kid, or a young man, wants people to see you that way? And yet, virtually everybody that comes to you, first thing they say is, you know, how are you related to Theodore? Oh, you're Theodore Roosevelt's great-grandfather. Oh, well, tell us. You know, it's, it's tough to take. And uh, I paid little attention to TR, and I also realized what an extraordinary man he was. And uh, inside, that I wasn't anything like that. And uh, so that was a further kind of 
to turn. It wasn't until I was in my 40s, believe it or not, I'm older than 40, it wasn't until I was in my 40s that, and I was forced to give a speech somewhere. I joined a club uh, and everybody had to take turns giving speeches, so I had to give a speech. This club contained some of the most brilliant men in the country. Many of them were university professors at Harvard and MIT. And by university, I don't mean professor, I mean university professor. That's the small group of Harvard of about 20 or so of their very best scholars. And I knew no matter what I had to say to them, they all knew more than I did about it. And they were known to be a very tough audience that really give it to you if you had problems. And so, so I figured the only thing I could do is talk about Theodore Roosevelt because if I got into trouble, some historian luminary challenged me on something, I could always say, well, the family knows. <laughs> And I got away with it. So then I began to get interested in TR, and I began, I realized I was never going to be TR, and didn't have to worry about it, and I had settled somewhat, you know, I was fairly comfortable with myself, so then I began to study him. Extraordinary guy. So, we're going to look at some of these adventures, I'll tell you some stories, and we'll see how these relate to his development. TR was clearly uh, the most sportsman uh, experienced president we ever had, and certainly in the White House, the most active sportsman we ever had. Uh, but I will focus primarily on the pre-presidential hunts uh, that happened. Now, we'll start in Maine. TR wa was a very puny, sickly little kid. And as was mentioned by somebody at one point, uh, his father encouraged him, said he had a great body, uh, a great mind, but a bad body, had to build it up. But TR, who had asthma, now asthma today is still a serious disease, but in those days it was a killer, and darn near killed him. Uh, but he took his father seriously, and he began working on it. Well, uh, he went to Harvard. He wanted to be a naturalist. He later switched to politicians. But uh, his first opportunity at a, at a big game hunt in a kind of a small way, took place in Maine. Uh, he went up with a couple of other guys, including a fellow who had tutored him uh, to uh, 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 get ready to go to Harvard. Uh, and they went up to northern Maine. Northern Maine is even more remote than North Dakota. Uh, and it's really hard to get there, particularly in those days. And Maine is a much bigger state than people realize. I mean, it's a huge state, and the whole northern tier of it is wilderness. And he met uh, uh, two guys, one really particularly Sewell, who was going to be his guide. Uh, and Cutler, his tutor, had taken Sewell aside, as I think Candace mentioned last night, and said, look, be careful this boy. Uh, he, he, you can see he's not very athletic, but he's got a lot of spirit, and he'll just go and go and go and you've got to be careful because uh, he'll go till he drops. And, uh, you know, we've got to worry because he's a delicate thing. Well, Sewell took one look at this guy and made the mistake that you see over and over and over again of guides and others met him in his earlier years of underestimating him. Uh, and Cutler underestimated him as well. In any case, Sewell became impressed with uh, the ability of this kid, they were hunting whitetail and other things, to, uh, to keep it up, keep going. So that was really his first experience. And he made a couple of, couple of trips there. But his first real big game hunting trip was here uh, in North Dakota, just southeast of here. And he came to hunt buffalo. And I won't tell you much about that story because it's so well known, but he arrived uh, at uh, Pyramid City, as it was called at the time, now Medora, uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, and the next morning, he got up early from what was a rather minimal hotel and uh, looked around to find a guy. And he, uh, he came across, by sort of accident, Joe Ferris. And Joe Ferris took one look at this guy, who was clearly an Eastern dude, and who, uh, of all things, most outrageously, wore glasses. And glasses was considered uh, at the time as a sign of moral degradation. And uh, 
people didn't like that. I didn't just take off my glasses here. Uh, and, uh, but he saw what he thought was a rich Eastern dude. And uh, so T.R. kept after him to take him as a guide. So he didn't really want to do it. Uh, Ferris didn't really want to do it. But T.R. kept after him and after him. And finally, they started off. Well, the hunt lasted, they get now, I think. They, they, they came south. Uh, up, they went up the Little Missouri uh, uh, near the Cannonball, and they started the hunt. Now, they stayed in the cabin of somebody uh, named uh, Lang, uh, Gregor Lang, who was a rancher, just arrived, a Scotsman, actually. And they used that as a base. And the first morning arrives, it's pouring rain, it's in the summer, gumbo, mud all over the place. Ferris thinks, ah, this is easy. And I says, well, why don't we wait another? No, no, no. TR wanted to go out. Day after day, out they went. They'd go out. They'd spend all day. No sign of a buffalo. They'd come back in. So, uh, uh, Ferris, exhausted, would fall asleep right after dinner. TR would talk to one or two o'clock with uh, Lang about all kinds of things, ranching, uh, and then they'd go out again. Uh, on the final day, this was now, I think, day 12 or so, uh, Ferris had begun to change his opinion about TR because of this incredible life he had and willingness to put up with all kinds of discomforts. They start out, they have nothing but, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of hard tack and some salt. Uh, they finally see buffalo tracks. They follow it all day, a couple of shots. They miss. They go on. The end of the day comes. They're going to sleep. They sleep out. Uh, they got no tent or anything, no food. They hadn't seen water or any more than just the rainwater, which at least was enough. Uh, they sleep outside using their saddles as a pillow with the horses because <coughs> they're afraid that uh, maybe Indians or some or rustlers will steal their horses. In the middle of the night, uh, the horses take off dragging the saddles. They follow the horses. Uh, so, you know, most of a couple of finally get the horses, they bring them back, they go back down, the rain starts pouring down. Uh, uh, Ferris's comment to TR was, I haven't ever done anything in my life of a criminal or immoral to deserve this. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> TR says, No, it's, it's great. They wake up at dawn, it, now in two inches of water. Uh, and the first thing that Ferris hears is T.R. muttering to himself. And he thinks, ah, finally broken it. What's he saying? He listens. And T.R. is saying, bully, this is the best time I've had it ever. <laughs> well, they finally shoot the buffalo and they come back. Uh, Ferris completely transformed about his view about T.R. The beginning, of, as I say, of many examples of people who underestimated him, but when spent time with him, particularly, interestingly, his hunting buddies. If you really want to know a person, go hunting with them, particularly